Welcome to the Kissing Spine podcast. How nice of you to join. In this podcast, I discuss several topics around kissing spine, like what kissing spine is, the different medical treatments, the function of different body parts, functional and dysfunctional training techniques, saddle fit, and a whole lot more. All put together to help you support your horse with the kissing spine. I wish you a lot of fun listening, and if you like this podcast, make sure to become a subscriber so you won't miss any of my episodes. Welcome to the Kissing Spine Podcast. How nice of you to join. In this podcast, I discuss several topics around kissing spine, like what kissing spine is, the different medical treatments, the function of different body parts, functional and dysfunctional training techniques, saddle fit, and a whole lot more. All put together to help you support your horse with the kissing spine. I wish you a lot of fun listening, and if you like this podcast, make sure to become a subscriber so you won't miss any of my episodes. Hi everyone, and welcome to a new episode of the Kissing Spine Podcast. Today is Black Friday, and I have so many sales up, and it's so good to see people buying, getting into the programs, and there's so many cool people that I'm going to be working with for the next two weeks, and for the next year, and I'm just... I'm so excited! <laughs> I really was looking forward on doing this and I'm so happy that people are making use of this sale. It's It's been an incredible year. Getting my programs together, reinventing a few things, making changes for the better and I'm just so happy that people are enjoying it. It's oh, It feels so good! I'm really, really excited. Which is a little bit weird because the topic of today's podcast is a little bit less exciting. But I want to share it with you anyway. Despite my high levels of energy because I'm so thrilled and low for the place right now. Because, oh, yeah, well, you know, I just really wanted to make an impact and really change my programs for the better. And I'm so happy that people are seeing a value and getting in. And, you know, I'm, I'm still a business owner. I'm working 60 hours a week, getting my horses done, helping people out. And I just wanted to do it in a different way. And now I can do it. And it's just, I'm I'm so super, super excited to work with you all. So for the people who got into my programs that I'm going to work with in um, the beta version of uh, how to uh, rehab to ride, for people who are getting in the rehab strategy, for people getting into the year program starting in January, Oh my God, welcome, and I will help you to the best of my ability. I cannot wait to start working with you, and I promise you that we're going to get the best results possible with your horse in the coming period. That being said, this podcast is about a huge mistake that I've made, or actually about how my horse Raven, who is my Frisian young mare, pointed me out that I wanted too much and that I needed to take a step back. So Raven is my non-kissing spine horse, but that doesn't mean that from these young horses, you cannot learn things that you can still apply with kissing spine horses. So Let me take you through a little bit of history with her and then I will fast forward, obviously. But I made a big mistake. So I started her under saddle about a year and a half ago. And last year, September, I really started to go from the phase of breaking her in, getting her under saddle, getting her familiar with that entire process. Then she had a month off. And then in the September after that, I really started riding her. So about five times a week for 20 minutes a day, I would be on just starting with work, uh, in the walk. And I was developing the walk. Then we transitioned to trot and, 
about last year, June, like Kenna would always be the gate that she was struggling in. It was really, really hard for her to Kenner, which is very normal for a young Frisian because especially the stifles is a part of the body that um, develops relatively late with Frisians. She was very overbuilt, so really stepping under and getting that thrust from her hind legs to jump into Kenner and to stay into the Kenner, that was really, really difficult for her. So I didn't, I didn't really do anything with that. I just kept on training, engaging her hind leg, getting those hind legs swing under more and more, getting that spine up, doing it in a walk, doing it in a trot. We did yielding, shoulder four, all that kind of stuff. She knows how to do it while being in the stretch and a little bit of working position. So last year, so I'm, I'm in a relatively new barn. These owners got in about two years ago and right after they moved in, I moved my horses there. Um, because I wanted to be in a bigger facility uh, with more indoor arenas where they would still have time every day outdoor because I feel it's very important that my horses go outside, that they're not in their stalls for 24-7. But, you know, I still want to have the luxury of being able to train all year despite the weather. So um, I moved to this yard. They're very nice owners. They're, they're very knowledgeable about how to house horses. They're doing a great job. And, you know, we have a very big facility, but weren't really doing uh, any competing and competitions or hosting them um, because of COVID. So last year was the time with COVID a little bit behind us to start organizing competitions. And I'm a rainer. So my competing experience is mostly in raining not in dressage. So I felt like, you know, now might be a good time. It's summer. Raven is doing well. So let's just start getting her in, in training level. So compared to other countries in the Netherlands, if you compete here, um, in whatever discipline you're doing, um, which is not Western, <laughs> you need to scale up and earn points to move up in a level. So you cannot just buy a Grand Prix horse and then um, starting Grand Prix. That's, that's not how it works here. So you need to start in training level and then you need to work your way up through the levels, gaining enough points. So your score needs to be over uh, 58 or 60% to get a point. And the higher your score, you can get three points per test. And then if you have 10 points, you can move up. So, you know, I just started in training level um, and about like training level it includes Kenner work, but um, they just allow to move in a working position. So no collection or nothing, just as long as they're going straight into the contact and they can do walk, trot, Kenner, circle, broken line, that kind of thing, then you're good. You should be able to do it. She wasn't entirely ready, but I was just curious to see how the judge would judge me. Now, I have to say... I have to admit that how judges are judging low level dressage tests are not the way that I would do it when it comes to bio, uh, biomechanically correct training them. Um, but ever since June, every month I've been competing with her in the training level. And by the end of September, I had enough points to level up to level one, which is cool. I was happy. Then I got excited. And the thing was that at a certain point, a judge said in training level, like she had grown a lot. She felt very unbalanced. We were just not really feeling it. And the judge came up to me and said, well, she's a five-year-old. She should be able to do a training level test properly. And every time the judge would say to me, you need to pick up your reins, you need to pick up your reins, you need to pick up your reins. But you need to give her more stability. But if I would pick up her reins, she would just make herself shorter. I don't want to pick up my reins. I want her to go from back to front. So if I would give an aid with my leg, I want her to push towards the contact. And the more I was going down this road of prepping her for competing, the less she would actually start moving from back to front. So all the prep work that I have been doing over the last year and a half with doing the work in hand and the lunging and getting her to stretch and to get her to move into the contact, I was slowly, piece by piece, breaking down to do what judges want to see in this country at training level. 
you can already see where this is going, right? <laughs> so, <clears throat> by the halfway October, I was going to do my first level one test. And I was just like, I already felt like this level is too high for her at this point. Like she cannot do it with the amount of engagement that people want to see here. She cannot really do the yielding because that's what you get in, in level one. So like yielding really expressively doing the big changes like they you you want to do a little bit of lengthening the stride over the diagonal but actually what they want to see is a fully extended trot well she's not strong enough to do that yet so there was a week of clinics at my yard and there was this one lady that was um i was told at least um she's an international judge a very experienced and um, she has an expertise in Baroque horses. So horses like Frisians and Andalusians and those type of horses. So, you know, we have actually a different competition for that type of horses here in the Netherlands as well that you can compete in. So you can just decide to go for those because they're judged a little bit differently. Now, I hate bashing on people. So I'm not going to talk about the lady in particular, but I had like, she is going to judge tests at my barn, at my yard where I have my horses. So I was not in a position to either have a discussion with her or just to get off and walk away. That politically speaking, and I even saying this out loud just makes me realize how wrong this is, but this is competing life. But getting off with someone who's going to judge tests multiple times over the coming year at the yard where I'm competing, I just didn't feel in the position to do that. So I didn't. You know, I just I stayed respectfully. I actually thought at a certain point, you know, maybe there's something I can learn from this. And maybe there's just something that I need to work through or something, you know, my curiosity was like, okay, don't give up, just do what she says, and literally everything she said is so much against what I have seen over the last decade to be working, to keep my horses soft and relaxed, and to keep my horses through the body uh, biomechanically correct. By the end of this 45 minute lesson, I was ready to cry. I felt incredibly guilty. And I had a very, very, very angry horse. So I didn't listen to my gut feeling. I got carried away with my own, um, how do you say that, ambition. I actually started believing, okay, she's five and a half now. Apparently she should be able to do a level one test. So, you know, let's let's see what we can get out of it. I had my points. I got decently scored, actually. I have to say that the judge that I was having the weekend after. But while I was riding, I didn't have a steer. She was curling behind the bit. I didn't have a break. And I didn't have a forward aid anymore. She shut down after that lesson and i felt terrible well in the week after i got slammed in my face by didi which you heard in a previous podcast so you know i had no choice but to go back to lunging because i wasn't able to ride with a concussion and for the last three weeks the only thing that i've been working on is getting her active again and getting her towards the contact again for three weeks. And obviously, in a recent post, I've been talking about the fear of taking a step back. And sometimes a step back feels like going backwards, but sometimes taking a step back is actually necessary to move forward. It's actually a step forward, but it feels like a step back because I stopped with riding, I went back to lunging. But what I was actually doing is make a step forward. Because what I've come to learn in the last three weeks of going back to lunging with her, and for the last week I've actually been doing some rhythm work again, is that 
I got a better stretch now compared to that I was having in the two months in the writing period between September and October. So her stretch is better now compared to the last two weeks. So I was overdoing it. I was asking a level of moving that was too high for her without compensation. So that means that for the last two months, she's actually been compensating in the training. And I didn't notice it. I thought she was doing rather well. But now seeing her stretch again and getting her back to that point, I'm like, ooh, yeah, I went too far. And that's okay. It happens. And now I actually worked on the kender work on the lunch with her. And she was never really able to stretch on the lunch in the kender. That was just a little bit too heavy for her, even without the rider. And a week ago, I had the best stretch in the kender that she has ever given me. It was so flowy. It was so loose. It was so through the body. Her strides were big. Her strides were balanced. She was so good. She was so good. So for the last week, I, I picked her up in the written work again. But the only thing that I've been doing is stretch work. Getting her into the contact. Getting her to reach forward again. Not picking her up. Not bringing her back into the working position, but stabilizing that content, getting her leaning into the content again without discussion, without uh, unclarity, just going back to the basics. And again, yes, it felt like a huge step back in the moment that I had to stop riding and go back to lunging with her. But now I really realize that it was a step forward. Because I went back to the basics, went back to my foundation, and that in foundation started improving, and therefore my written work now is better compared to what I had been doing between September and October. So the quality of my writing is now so much higher because I went back to that foundation again, and no, it didn't feel fun. And of course not. If I cannot ride because I got a slam on my head and, and, and you have a concussion, you're like, okay, I'm not going to ride because I'm not supposed to. Um, well, I couldn't because I was really too dizzy and too nauseous to do so. So better not to. That, that I was at the yard was already not the smartest idea of the planet. Mm. But I'm really happy that it happened to put myself back on track, put myself back on the foundation and to reconnect with my horse again. So I withdrew from all the competitions until January and I'm going to take the next two months to but work on that foundation again and build up that foundation again. And then maybe in January, I'm going to start competing again in first level and see what happens. But right now, like I wanted to go for the regionals. I let go of that idea. She's only five and a half. I can go to the regionals next year or the year after or the year after that. I don't have to do that right now. What I want to do right now is enjoy riding my horse. And honestly, for the last two months, I wasn't really enjoying riding my horse. I wasn't because it was a fight. It was a discussion. We, I was not having fun. She was not having fun. I was just doing the exercises that needed to be trained for the competition. And I just got carried away with it. And this is human. This is normal. And we are so hard on ourselves sometimes when it comes to getting carried away with something and then realizing it wasn't working. And then owning up to the fact that it wasn't working and taking a step back to the point where it was working is something that a lot of people struggle with. Because then you need to face your ego that you made a mistake. And I would like you to think of it this way. If you made a mistake, it means you can learn from it and then make a different decision. So there's no reason to get upset with yourself. There's no reason to get upset with your horse. There's no reason necessarily to feel guilty. It's just being aware, okay, I made a mistake. 
where did I lose myself? Well, let's go back to that point, see if we can find each other again, find our relaxation, find our softness, find our connection, and then we're going to start working from there again. I got carried away. And that's one of the hardest things being in the horse world. There are so many people having opinions. There are so many people telling you what to do and telling you that you should do stuff better. Even I get affected. And I'm a very stubborn person that is that fairly easily sticks to her plan. But even this time, I just got carried away. And I can spend so much time sulking, being angry with myself and upset with myself. But why would I do that? I don't help myself with it. I don't help my horse with it. The only thing that I can help me and my horse with is go back to that foundation. So maybe you find yourself in a spot that a lot of people are telling you what to do. And maybe you have this gut feeling that you shouldn't or that they're wrong. just doesn't sit with you well. Or maybe you feel like, hey, I noticed that my connection with my horse and the quality of the work with my horse was better before. So maybe I should take a step back. Maybe I just wanted a little bit too fast. Maybe the chances of us asking more of our horses than they can give is so that the chances are so much higher compared asking too little. So have you lost it? Do that check with yourself. Have you? Have you been asking too much? Is your horse really giving you the quality that you know that your horse can give? If not, maybe you should take that step back just to make that step forward again. In any case, I hope this this made sense to you. I hope this helps you. I'm like, I'm not a super talented rider. I'm average, look like most of you, and I'm human. I make mistakes. Even if I know better, I still make the mistakes. It's a con- it's a constant cycle of working on my horses and working on myself and seeing what, where, and when I can improve things. I'm not holy. I make mistakes too, just like you. The only thing that I try to do is to challenge you to think at it as a possibility to do something differently and make a change. Happy weekend, you all. I hope you enjoyed this podcast and until the next one. I would like to thank you again for listening to this podcast. If you think that this podcast is interesting to someone else, please share it on social media so others can find it too. This way we can create more awareness about what the options are with a kissing spine horse. I would like to thank you again for listening to this podcast. If you think that this podcast is interesting to someone else, please share it on social media so others can find it too. This way we can create more awareness about what the options are with a kissing spine horse.